All right, well, good evening. Pray you're doing well and that your bellies are full, but not too full so that you're not droggy for a 10-minute sermon. All right, so on Wednesday nights, we've been walking through what's so awful about pride. And we are beginning and kind of, for this first part, really remaining on the vertical component, right, between us and God, our response to the Lord. And basically, uh, everything I'm uncovering is that pride causes us to want to be independent from God, try and step out from underneath of God's authority, and uh, pride makes us completely delusional, right? Independence from our creator. And so the last couple weeks, we looked at the fact that he is our creator, and we are dependent beings. In every sense, we need air and food and water and naps and all sorts of things, right? Clothes, all of it. Those are the things we need. And so um, as we step into this idea, right, that we need to declare our own right, we need to get out from underneath his authority. This is what pride causes us to think. The God who is eternal, eternal, okay? There is never a time that he was not. And everything is from him and through him and to him. And he spoke, simply spoke, and it all came to be. And you can't even comprehend how huge and magnificent the universe is, or even how tiny and intricate it all is. That God, the creator of it all. See, humility says that you are the eternal creator, the sovereign one, and you are the one who declares what is right and wrong. I will listen to you, okay? That you are the author just like the maker of an automobile makes the vehicle and declares this is its use and its purpose. But pride says, I will declare my own right and wrong, okay? I've got this, and I have the freedom to be able to do what I want to do. Okay? If I want to put Kool-Aid in the gas tank, I can. That's freedom. So I want you to think about Genesis chapter 3. Listen to the first five verses of Genesis chapter 3. I want to read them. Now the serpent was more crafty than, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the trees, uh, uh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes, sorry, uh, in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You can be like God. So Satan's temptation, uh, who is the one in Genesis who up to this point has declared that which is good? God has. God made it and said it was good. God is the one who declares that which is good, that which is right and wrong. Satan comes up in the temptation, when you think about this tree, you are not to think of it as an apple, the forbidden apple that we always think of, okay? What is the tree? What does the tree represent? What is the name of the tree? The tree is the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. God has declared what is good and evil, but if you take from this tree, you will be able to declare that which is good and evil. 
But Satan sneaks in this temptation. He says, has God said that you cannot eat from any tree within the garden? Now, what's subtle that he's woven in there is the suggestion that God is holding out on you. In other words, God is a cosmic party pooper. He doesn't like to have any fun, no fun at all. God is withholding good things from you. Now, there's millions of fruit trees around to eat out of. This is a magnificent place. And Satan's like, has God said you can't touch any of that? But it puts in that seed of doubt that says, wait a second, maybe he is holding out on me. Now, what should Adam and Eve have said at that point? Look around at this place. This place is amazing. God is obviously good, like really good. There is abundance of everything I need and joy. There is delight in this place. But you know what pride does? Pride entertained the thought that God is not good even though all he's done. We've seen that repeatedly in the series. That's why the Bible charges us over and over for us to be thankful, to lead our hearts into thanksgiving because pride causes us to go, you know what? I deserve more. Pride entertained the thought that God is holding out on you. Pride entertained the thought that you deserve more. You know what you deserve? No limits. That's what you deserve. No guardrails. In fact, God knows that if you eat from that tree, you can become like God. You can become equal with God. You can be the one who determines that is that which is right and wrong. In fact, you can declare your own truth. <laughs> declare your own truth. Cry out. <laughs> Say it ain't so. Yeah. I love it. Now, doesn't that sound just like our culture these days? Declare your own truth. That's what's so awful about pride. Within this situation, in this setting, it's so delusional. The created dependent being, again, who needs naps, okay? You need lots of naps, and vitamins, and my elbow hurts, and why is this happening? But I'm going to declare my own truth. I am the source of truth. Now, you want to know what's so amazing about Genesis chapter 3? That even in this account, after man rebels in all of his pride and welcomes death, in a standing in the nakedness of his shame, because now he's experienced good and evil on the inside, and he's hiding from Eve, and he's afraid that even then, do you know what God does? God comes and finds him right where he is. And then God meets him in his need. He kills an animal, the first death, and covers his shame. And then you know what God says next. Even though he passes out the curses to Adam and Eve and the serpent, 
Do you know that it was at that moment that God promised his son? It was at that moment that God promised the death of his son. How much more heinous does that make pride look then? That shakes its fist at God. That says, I will declare my own truth. I will come out from under your authority. I will do what I want to do. And God's response in that setting is to offer his son. How magnificent is our God. There is no one like him. Right? Everything is from him and through him and to him. And from eternity past, he planned and he knew. And he chose you. And he gave his son that you might know him. So may we examine our pride. May we examine the charges from culture that say, step outside, declare your own truth. And may we look and go, you are the author of truth. If you have given your son for me, I can trust you. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we walk and we look step by step at pride and realize what a hindrance it is to our salvation, to us coming and knowing you, God, that you oppose the proud, but you give grace and mercy to the humble. May we see these truths from your text, and may we realize the absolute necessity for us to come underneath your teaching and your truth and for us to submit to you because you are a good God. You are our heavenly Father, and we trust you. You've given your son for us. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.